everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to another episode of the Missing Peace podcast sponsored by Foragen. Our goal is to bring you hope for tomorrow, the latest and greatest in intactivism and regenerative medicine, stories from Foragen supporters just like you, and the missing piece from men's lives, the human foreskin, regenerated just for you. I'm your host, Jordan Norell, and joining me today is Brandon Murata, director of the multiple award-winning definitive documentary, American Circumcision. Equal parts, brilliant and kind, with a little bit of mischief thrown in for good measure. Brennan has become a good friend of mine and has been a huge help to me in my work at Foragen. His new film, released yesterday, is groundbreaking, a real game changer. It is the most important film of our generation, unequivocally my new favorite movie, and I've been waiting years for a film like this. Uh, it's gentle, yet powerful. I was moved to tears multiple times throughout the film. I can't recommend American Circumcision too strongly. Of course, it goes without saying, share it with anyone who you want to really understand this issue. Uh, in fact, the film is linked up below, so pause this podcast, go and watch it right now. We'll wait. All right, I'm assuming you watched it, and because uh, there will be spoilers, so... Uh, you can hear my full review of this uh, film, American Circumcision, also linked up below. But without further ado, let's jump right in. So, Brendan, welcome. It is great to have you on the show. Thank you. That is one of the best introductions I've ever gotten. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, Brendan, could you tell us how you got interested in the topic of circumcision and how that led to you creating this film? You know, it's funny. I think your audience will have a much greater understanding as to why I made the film. And, and every interviewer or reviewer or news person I talk to always wants to start with that question, well, why did you decide to make this film? And to me, it's kind of obvious, you know, if there was another issue that affected everyone in America, every man, every partner of a man, every parent and child in the most personal way possible, and no one had made a major large scale documentary about it, you'd think, well, of course, we need to make that film. And then when you add to that the fact that it's taboo, the fact that um, it affects us in the most personal ways possible, it involves all these identity level questions and issues and seems to bring up the strongest emotions in people, it's really obvious why you'd make a film about this. And for me, I went through a period in my life where I was letting go of a lot of old patterns that didn't serve me. I was reading a lot about early childhood psychology, I was changing my beliefs, I was changing my diet, I was changing the way that I treated people and behaved. And I ran across this issue while learning about all that, and it bothered me because this is something I couldn't change. And, you know, I, I, I like to be in control of my own life. I think that anyone who's worked with a film director would not be surprised to, you know, know that I, they want to be in control. Uh, and so I couldn't control this. There wasn't really anything I could do at the time, or at least that's what I thought. And so I just decided, you know, out of mind, I'm just going to forget about this. I'll push it away and I won't think about it. And then uh, at the same time, I was practicing meditation. And the type of meditation I practice is known as Zazen, Zen meditation. And there's nothing mystical about it. It's literally you sit, you stare at a wall, and you be present with whatever feelings come up. That's it. There's no um, imagination. It's literally just, Zazen literally means just sitting. So it's literally just sitting and staring at a wall. Um, it might sound exciting, but I assure you it's the most, like, if anything exciting happens, it's because your mind is so bored that it is just trying to find something. But you're being present with whatever feelings you actually have instead of pushing them away or trying to silence them. And so during this process, I had the word circumcision come into my mind. And normally I would push that thought away because it's kind of an uncomfortable subject. It's an uncomfortable thought. And I think a lot of people, when they, this, they think about this subject, they go, oh, that's, I don't know, that seems a little weird. And they kind of try to push it out of their mind. But because I was meditating, I didn't push it out of my mind. That was my practice. I just stayed present with whatever's there. So I stayed present with it. And when I did, I felt this cold sensation in the body. And it felt like all my energy just sort of drained down to my belt and it was really uncomfortable. And it happened a couple times during this meditation. So I thought, that's weird. I, 
you know, I should see what that was about. And I pay attention to what comes up in meditation. And often that would, you know, lead to me discovering emotions and feelings I didn't know I had. Um, so then I went home and I started researching. And one of the first things I found was foreskin restoration, which is something we talk about in the film where men take the remaining skin that they have and stretch it over time. The same way you put like a gauge in your ear. Um, and they stretch it over time to get a covering of that part of the body again. And I thought, all my life I've been told there's nothing you can do about this, the way that you are is the way that you are. But clearly that's not true. So what else have I been told about this issue that isn't true? And I think that discovering restoration gave me permission to explore this issue because I was no longer powerless around it. It wasn't just like, let's find out about what happened and how there's nothing I can do about it now. It was, let's find out about this thing that I was told was permanent. And even though um, at the time, you know, manual restoration does not bring everything back, um, but there is something I can do. And so that kind of gave me permission to start researching. And I, um, I read everything I could on the subject. I went through one of my interview subjects in the film, John Geisicker calls the obsessive epiphany. And virtually every, every time I talk to people about this concept of the obsessive epiphany, they go, oh, you know, I went through that too. And the obsessive epiphany is when you, you read everything you can about this subject and you're just learning every, you know, you watch every YouTube video, you listen to every podcast, you do everything you can to learn about it. Um, and you start to realize that what your culture told you about this subject is not the full story. And I went through that process and I felt like that I wanted to share that information with people in some way. And at the time I was living in Los Angeles, I was doing film work. I was doing a lot of low budget horror films and I actually even did some reality TV. Uh, please forgive me. Uh, and you know, like, a lot, but you know, just things that paid and, and uh, I love making films. It's always what I've wanted to do. It's what I've wanted to do since I was 14. And so it felt kind of natural then to use the medium that I had trained in and the thing that I love doing to share that information with others. So that's what led to the film. Wow, uh, well, we're glad that you made it. I have to say it's really interesting. I actually, I'm sorry, getting used to this new mic. Um, I have to say, I also had a similar experience with, uh, first of all, of course, with the obsessive epiphany, as we all have. Um, but after a few years, I kind of just tried to stop thinking about it, just let go of it. Uh, I was peripherally following Foragen, but um, it was when they really started to pick up speed a year ago, a lot more things kind of started to happen and come together. Uh, their first experiment was completed. Um, and since then, they've made a lot of progress and, you know, we admit it, and I'm now the podcast host, obviously, and we've made a lot of progress in getting our peer review submitted, now we're resubmitting it, and working on fundraising to ultimately bring this uh, regeneration of the foreskin to reality for all men. And, you know, if that hadn't happened, I'd probably still just, you know, I, I went through a process of kind of psychological healing, which is what really allowed me to uh, work on this issue. But... Um, then I would have just, you know, restored and probably forgot about it. But um, because of this, I'm, you know, going, kind of going all in. And I believe that um, regeneration is possible if enough people are aware of this issue. And so that's why, one of the reasons why I'm ultimately so committed to it. Um, On that note, I think that a lot of people have the idea that if you learn about this issue, that there's only one way to respond to it. They sort of have the idea that either you say that I'm fine and disavow the parts of you that feel uncomfortable feelings about it, or that you go into those feelings and identify with those and become a sort of angry victim. And I don't think that either of those perspectives are true. It is possible to hold all parts of yourself at the same time. And it's funny because I'll meet people and I had someone tell me um, that they were expecting a sort of angry activist and that that was sort of the role they thought I would play. And they're like, you actually just seem like a regular dude. It's like, of course, because I'm still in touch with the part of me that just wants to have a normal life. And I still do all the things that I love and enjoy. Um, and at the same time, I'm sharing information with the world that hopefully will lead to better experiences for the people that are being born today. 
and being present with the parts of myself that don't always feel fine and at times feel hurt or uncomfortable. It's, it is possible to do both. To, and I, I don't think that anything good comes from saying that a part of you or part of your feelings are wrong or incorrect. And I, that is difficult to do for people at times because I think most people have splits in their feelings where they feel one direction and they feel the exact opposite direction at the same time. They feel like, oh, I'm fine. Like, I do have a good life. I do have a good sex life. Um, I do have, you know, people around me that I like, or I maybe don't even have a good relationship with my family too. And then at the same time, there's a part that's like, well, there's all this information about it and it is, I have these feelings, you know, like that's, both of those can be true. Mm. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I'd love to get more into the psychology of it and kind of your experience of that in a minute. But uh, first, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the film itself. So um, how long have you now been spending on this uh, whole project from conception to release? So I don't, I don't like to think about that a lot. Cause it took six years to make the film, and then it took... Um, another year of festivals and touring before we got to the point where it's out on video. And so what, like you say, you didn't like what allowed you to do that? Like, is there something that was driving you or? I felt like I had a, a duty to share this information with the world and it wasn't continuously six years. So during that time, I basically, my method of doing it was I would do some gig work. I would do paid work for other people and then I'd work on the film and then I'd do paid work for other people and then I'd work on the film um, and I'd keep my expenses low and things like that. You know, I actually edited an entire feature that won the narrative award at the Austin Film Festival and during that time. And I did a short documentary for a friend and I did you know, a lot of other some corporate video and just a bunch of other different projects. So I was sort of bouncing between the two and that's part of the reason it took the time that it did. But it's also that the way that I approached the documentary was not as scripted as I probably could have done. Now, knowing the documentary process in retrospect, it would probably be a lot easier to script things in advance even you know and people don't think of documentary being as, as being scripted but you can't approach it that way mm -hmm. but at the time i did it in a much more open-ended way where i would just interview people and see what i got and film things and see what i got and ended up sort of creating the structure and post-production and just like uh when you write something there is a thinking process in the midst of that most people when they're writing a novel or a story or even an essay there has to be a point where it sort of gestates in their mind. And, and so that was part of the process as well. You know, sometimes I'd need to step back and kind of think about what I wanted to do with a particular scene or what was important to include and not include and all of those sorts of questions. And then of course, uh, getting it out to the world. Um, when we finished the film, I could have easily just sort of, dumped it online and everyone who already knows about the issue would have seen it. But I wanted this to be a big release. I wanted this to be available on the platforms that matter. I wanted it to reach people who might not know about this issue. And I also wanted to frame it um, as what it is, as a, as a large film and as something that people should take seriously. I think that very often the way that someone responds to something has a lot to do with the context that they see it in. So they actually, there's a study they did, they had a concert violinist who charges like a thousand dollars a ticket to be seen in Carnegie Hall or some, I don't know that it's that high, but it's, it's large, you know, he plays venues like that. He knows the best in the world. They had him play on a subway and people would just walk by, right? They didn't even notice that this was like probably one of the best musicians in the world. Um, but that framing of having him in that context makes people respond to it differently. And so I'm aware that the framing of a film that you pay for on iTunes or Amazon or Vimeo or, you know, one of these other platforms is different than if someone sends you a free video on YouTube. And I want to, you know, that process takes a little while because you have to go back and forth with the distributor and you have to work on contracts and lawyers are involved and everyone takes five to seven business days to get back to you. And, but at the end of the day, uh, it's, I think it's worth it. Right. So what we're basically seeing is your obsessive epiphany as it evolved over time. And, you know, I, like, I kind of like that, like you're, the way that you're taking your interview subjects is at their face value at what they have to say, and then putting that together afterwards. 
So I find that interesting that you didn't script it all and that that's why it took so long. Um, yeah. And I also really appreciate that you um, are putting a lot into um, really making it big because, you know, that's, that's the whole thing with Forge. And it's like, um, you know, we know this is possible. We know that we can regenerate the human foreskin um, with current technology. What's really the problem is uh, getting people to be aware of that and to, to believe in that, to show that we are the ones who can do it. Um, and so that's the, that's the real challenge, the framing that this um, is possible and that we can do it and that the time is now. So, um, but on your film, I'd really like to know, um, so what's really amazing too is you didn't just interview like whoever was kind of willing to do the film, but you actually went out and interviewed all of the top voices on both sides. Um, I'm wondering how you achieve this. How did you get all of these people who are, you know, the top voices on the subject in the world to uh, talk in your film? The short answer is that I ask. I think that most of the people involved on this issue have what you might call niche fame, which means that to people who know about the issue, they seem like a really big deal. But to the rest of the world, no one really knows. I mean, it's not like the the experts on the circumcision issue are, you know, people that the majority of the population knows. They're not going to get stopped on the street the way that a real celebrity would. So they are, they are accessible. You can email them and people will get back to you. Um, and my process when I started was I actually, I would, anyone who contacted me, I'd interview them. It's just that a lot of those interviews didn't make the film. Um, and occasionally I would stumble across someone though, who was not famous or not known, but I had something really interesting to contribute. There are a few of those interviews in the film too. But the way that I approached it is I essentially would just ask, I would email the person and I would say, I'm doing this film. Um, I'd love to interview you. And the people who said yes, tended to be people who wanted their voice heard on this issue. And I think that people who are working on this issue are aware that it's highly controversial. On both sides of the debate, they're aware that it's controversial. And the people who ended up saying yes were people who were willing to put their voice out there in that controversy. So there were a lot of people who said uh, no, just because they didn't want to be involved in controversy. But the ones who said yes were, they were, you know, uh, some of them like, you know, Brian Morris, which is, I think is one of the main people you're referring to, uh, was very eager to debate and activists. He wanted to put his name out there on that. And even when I interviewed him, you know, one of the last questions I always ask, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think we should talk about? And he said, well, yeah, the intactivists make this point and I want to refute that. And so he was, he was aware of what those sort of talking points were and wanted to put his voice out there against them. And that tended to be the case for all the interview subjects. He said yes. Right. So in interviewing people like Brian Morris, uh, Edgar Schoen, um, people who, uh, my guess is you probably have a different viewpoint from them. Uh, at least a lot of people seem to. Um, I'm curious why it was important for you to interview people on both sides. So, you know, there's this huge activist movement that's coming up and a lot of people who are restoring their foreskins or want their foreskins back. You know, most people who, the people who are more aware of this issue, uh, as Ronald Goldman says in your film, you know, are the people who are upset about it, who care about it. Um, although there are a lot of people who aren't aware. So why was it for you important for you to cover those few voices who are actually really still strongly in support? Um, those at the AAP, those who did the HIV AIDS studies. Um, why did you cover like those as well as the activist movement that we're familiar with? So there's a couple reasons, but I think the biggest is that I wanted this film to be undismissible. If I just interviewed one side, then the other side says, well, you didn't refute this and you didn't talk about this and you didn't, you know, you should have talked to the real experts, right? And when you have both sides, the top voices in both sides, it's harder for everyone involved to ignore. So you can't tell me that uh, there was something that went unacknowledged or that wasn't talked about because we have both in there. And when I, it's interesting, when I started making the film, 
there were some pro-circumcision people. There's one pro-circumcision person in particular who told me, like, well, why would you even interview the intactivists? They're fringe. They're not important. Uh, you know, it's even absurd to give them a, a platform. And it's interesting that the debate now has swung the other way, where I have people ask me, like, why would you even interview those pro-circumcision people? They're all nutcases. Like, they've clearly been refuted by the evidence. And this is just in the six years of making the film that that swing has happened where I now have people on social media say things like, well, why, like, why would you even interview that guy and give him a platform? I'm talking about the pro-circumcision side. Um, and when I spoke with Andrew Freeman, who's a member of the latest uh, American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement on circumcision, this is something that is seen as a pro-circumcision policy statement, he, he acknowledged that the intactivists are the center of the debate now. So that's really interesting to me that in the six years I've been, I, I took to make the film, we went from... Uh, the intactivist movement being seen as like, why would you even interview them to, they're the center of this debate, and you really couldn't make a film that was definitive on this issue that did not acknowledge them or, or portray them or interview them in some way. I also think it's important because they've done studies on uh, teaching. This is, a, this is something I learned. This is the, the YouTuber who runs the channel Veritasium did his thesis on this, on, on scientific education through video. And what he found is he would, he would show people a science video where someone would explain a scientific concept in the video. And he'd give them a test before showing the video and people did really poorly because they didn't know the concept. So then he shows them a video that explains the concept. He'd ask people, um, did you, do you feel like the video was good? Was it clear? Did you learn something? They all said, yeah, it's really clear, really good video. I learned a lot. Uh, he'd give them the test dent again and they'd score worse. <laughs> And he goes, what happened? You guys told me the video was great. And he realized they had these misconceptions and the video didn't address the misconceptions. What happened is they had an idea in their brain that was completely wrong. They watched the video, they go, I learned something. And then they remember their misconception, which they'd heard thousands of times through, through culture and through the world around them. And they would put that down with even greater confidence than before. So he goes, okay, I'm gonna try this again. He does the second video and there's two people in the video and one voices the misconception. And then the other, through a dialogue, addresses that misconception and leads that person to the correct viewpoint. And he's doing this with scientific concepts that, like the law of thermodynamics, these are not things that are up for debate. Um, and so he interviews the people the second time and he says, how, how was that video? They go, that was really confusing. Like there was one guy who said one thing and there's one guy who said another thing. I don't know what I'm supposed to believe. And he gave them the test again and they did a little better. So because it was confusing to them, they had to pay attention and they learned the way that human beings are actually evolved to learn through social dialogue. Most of us did not learn, you know, like if you think about human evolution and going back to like a tribal setting, it, we didn't learn from one authority telling us what to believe. We learned through dialogue with each other. And so if you want to create that dialogue, which I, I do a lot through the film, I have one person say something and an interview subject who I interviewed years later directly address the thing that they're saying, um, then you have to have both sides. You have to have people who voice each perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is important because when it comes to this issue, there are a lot of misconceptions. And misconceptions that even pro-circumcision people will say, yeah, that's actually not true. That's not one of the arguments that we actually make. You know, one of them being like, it's cleaner. And like when I talk to members of the American Academy of Pediatrics, they go, that's not really the reason that even we advise doing this. So to, you have to address those misconceptions if you're actually going to share new information with people. That's really important to do. Right. Um, so with this dialogue, when you're when you're creating that is it do you see it as sort of like there's the pro circumcision versus the anti circumcision is that the main conflict in the film um or would you say there's some other psychological or some kind of cultural some other forces at work besides just these people yeah so so the way that i edit is i'm sort of doing it topically and the, the most sort of outline I had going is I know, okay, we're going to talk about sexuality, obviously. We're going to talk about anatomy. We're going to talk about um, the psychological impact. We're going to talk about those, the HIV studies that were done in circumcision. And so I'm kind of doing it by that. 
and, and the film sort of follows a pattern of that there's a personal story and then we go into scientific data. Because again, there's studies on scientific learning that people actually learn more through personal stories than they do through data. You know, um, a million is a statistic, but one person is a story. Right. And so when I am approaching that, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of conflict. I'm thinking about what is the range of viewpoints and how can I lead the audience through those viewpoints such that they're clear, like this is one perspective and this is the other, and this is what the debate is. Um, and as far as the thematic conflict, which I think is sort of what you might be asking about more, I don't really see the film in terms of good guys and bad guys or that there is one side for and one side against. I sort of use the issue of circumcision almost like a, a Rorschach test in the sense that how someone responds to this is going to reveal something about their character. And I feel like, you know, the way that circumcision is typically framed in the media is that it's this one-time decision that parents make once and then you never have to think about it again. And it's also framed as this sort of pros and cons list. And in reality, it's a, it reveals our values. This is, a, this is a practice which reveals something about human nature and how we respond to it reveals something about human nature. And so the conflict that I see in the film is a difference between values and who people are as, as people. And I, there is a, one frame that's presented where circumcision is simply data. It is, there's these statistics they have, and some of those statistics say that if you do it, like the rates of certain things go down and, and the rates of other things are different. And, um, and then the other view is a more holistic view of human beings of the idea that you can't remove a part of someone's body without them having feelings about it. And, and, you know, some of those people will feel that their choice was taken away or that they lost something. Um, at one of my interview subjects runs a nonprofit called not just skin. The idea being like, when we, Oh, it's just a flap of skin is one of the things people say, but human beings are not just skin. There's a full emotional human being there who is going to have feelings about anything, anything that you change about his body. Um, even if you were to, you know, like remove someone's earlobe, which I don't think people would, I mean, some people might say, oh, my earlobes are very sensitive. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it is not as personal a part of the body as the genitals. Even if you were to just do that, people would have really strong feelings about it. Um, and so I think that there is a, a exploration in the film of people who, view humans as just sort of uh, data and, and uh, statistics and people who are willing to look at the full emotional human and actually explore what this means for them as people and what, the, what this means about their values and what this means about our culture. Right. So the, the experience you're crafting for the viewer isn't just, um, you know, all the information, all of the, you know, this is, what health statistics this affects and this is um, that it's has this cultural meaning to this person. And, but it's also the deeper like personal experiences of men, of parents, of, um, and, right. You know, even the, the character study you say is sort of the doctors or the people who are promoting it. Um, and it really is showing all, all of those. It's not just a science education video. It is a movie. And in it, like any movie, it says something about the human experience. Right. Which makes sense why I cried multiple times throughout the movie. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so is that part of, I guess that's also kind of a part of the persuasion is showing the emotion behind it. Because if people don't, you know, if people aren't making these decisions logically, if it's not just the logic that's influencing them, but really how they feel about it, how it affects their uh, experience of the bodies, then you also have to make an emotional movie to sort of influence that. Right. And on the question of persuasion, I don't even feel like the thing I'm trying to persuade people of is anything about circumcision itself, except the idea that this issue is larger than you realized that this is an important issue, uh, an issue that every person should be aware of. So I, I would say that I'm not even, like, what you think about circumcision at the end of the film is kind of up to you. I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to convince people of any perspective there. 
as much as to open the perspective that they have. So it is not just this singular tiny, you know, it's this one time decision and like it only affects like these few little bits of data, but it's a, it is a larger question about who we are as a people and what our values are. I really, really uh, love that you like take this sort of balanced perspective in trying to raise the discussion rather than just trying to throw out your own opinion. However, um, one of our viewers uh, asked a question saying, Brendan has maintained a journalistic integrity by not taking sides, which is great. Of course, you need to do that for the film. Uh, but now that you are finished, are you willing to say which side you would take in the film, in the, which side you'd sort of fall on of the debate? I feel like I might start putting more of my own perspective out there at some point, but if I do, it will probably be in the form of a book. So mm -hmm. there is always the possibility for that, but I would like to, before I do that, really clarify the thoughts that I have. I'm not someone who feels the need to, you know, make an outburst on social media about everything that happens in the world, everything is in the news. Um, I would want to do that. I, I take the issue seriously enough that I would want to do that in a very collected and clear way. And I think the perspective I would have to offer might be different than anything that's already out there. I would hesitate also to put it out there in a very unfinished form because I know people would try to put it in a box and say, well, you're one of these types of people or you're one of these types of people. Um, when I'm actually trying to create a new category of some kind. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I like that. It's, you know, I guess my perspective is pretty obvious. I now have 25 hours worth of material um, on my own YouTube channel. So, um, but I appreciate that you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, so, <laughs> well, you're clarifying your perspective in a different way, right? It's just a different medium and a different way of putting it out there. Yeah, it's just I, I. And which, I, personally, for me, that's a really, um, I think, not another powerful way of showing the actual transformative process so that people can um, sort of see someone struggling with it, see someone with their own battles on their bad days, on their good days. Um, um, so, yeah. Uh, how about, was there anything that, like, really challenged you when you were making this film? Were there any big... Um, struggles or difficulties or I think the biggest challenge was organization yeah. because there's so much to explore around this topic um, and how do you condense it all into one film that was the biggest challenge and then getting some sort of structure to it so that it didn't feel episodic like there's just all these bits of facts but there's actually an emotional through point to the film right um, and that was something I really struggled with for a while. There was a point where I was about two years, two, maybe three years into the project. And I had like a stack of hundred hours of footage and no idea how I was going to turn that footage into a film. I was just like, what am I doing? Like, is this even good? Is this going to come out right? Um, and I've heard it said that process looks like failure. You know, it looks, it looks like failure until you actually succeed. And I was, sort of thinking about that, like how I was going to do that. And I went to this like place in my hometown and I sat down with like a cup of tea and I'd read this blog post by someone named Stephen Presserfield who wrote the war of art. He's the, someone who writes a lot about the creative process. And one of the things that he talks about is the structure of novels and the structure of stories. And in that he goes through the stages of grief and his stages of grief are, were a little bit different than the ones that I'd heard. So I think you're probably familiar with the first one, which is uh, shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, deliberation, decision, integration. But those last couple are a little different, right? Mm -hmm. The idea being that this, this thing happens, you know, in, in the, like the hero's journey, this thing happens to you that pulls you out of your mundane world and your initial reaction is to say no to it. And then you go through a process around it where it actually you integrate. Uh, and I, the model I heard before, you sort of jump to acceptance, right? And that the idea that there's a 
period of depression and then a point where you're kind of deciding what you're going to do and then you make a decision and you sort of integrate it in some way was interesting to me. And so he was actually breaking down the structure of novels this way. And I thought that's an interesting structure too for a film, for this issue. And so I put those words up on a piece of paper and then I started taking the categories I had and seeing where they fit. So, um, okay, shock. That would be the procedure itself, the, the dramatization that we open with. There's the shock that people have when they see people protesting it. Um, there's the denial, the, the history, the um, various sort of medical claims that sort of attempt to minimize the feelings people have around this. There's the anger, which you know, deals a lot with the sexuality. It deals a lot with female genital cutting and things like that. And you can go through all of the aspects of this issue and kind of see, oh, this one's, you know, bargaining. Like, that's probably foreskin restoration, right? Um, and, and so that's sort of the moment I had that, there was a structure to the film and there was an emotional journey where even though you might be talking to different people in different places, they were all sort of taking you on the same emotional through point. So that was, that was my intention with that. Wow. That's uh, fascinating. Um... I'm going to have to look that up now and like watch the film again and like look for each of the things. Yeah, I know. It's, it's almost an Easter egg. I hesitate to, I feel, it feels sometimes a bit like giving away the magic trick, but I also feel like there's a sense in which I think if I did my, my job as a filmmaker, you feel it. And so I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just ex telling you what you've already felt. Right. So you said that you've, had around 100 hours of um, film before doing this. I assume there's probably some stuff you wanted to include that you weren't able to. Was there anything in particular that you really wanted to? There was, there? yes. There's one, one thing that I found really interesting that I didn't have space for. And it, I'm going to get into a little bit of a spoiler with it. So Fuambai, the woman who is pro-female genital cutting, sort of, in our film. The woman who chose female circumcision as an adult is also a anthropologist and a very well-trained one, one who's, who's done a lot of work on this issue. And one of the things that she talks about is the symbolism of male and female circumcision. And so I had a sequence for that, and originally I was going to actually animate it with sort of like, maybe like African... Uh, artwork or, or like maybe go back even further sort of like a cave painting type thing where she talks about the symbolic origins of circumcision mm -hmm. and one of the things that she says there is that in the early tribes that practiced this there was the idea that you had to create gender and that the foreskin represented the feminine element in men and the clitoris represented the masculine element in women and people were basically gender neutral when born. And so you had to remove the masculine from women and remove the feminine from men. You know, the clitoris is literally a gland. It's a, it's a nub. It's penetrating. Um, it's this thing that sticks out from the body. And the foreskin is wet and it's enveloping. It's, it's receiving. Um, and you can see sort of how these body parts, you might perceive them as having a particular gender. And she said that one of the reasons she thought that female circumcision was so hated in Western culture was that Western women had fought extremely hard for the right to play masculine roles. So we had a large feminist movement in this country, and if you tell a woman that she's not allowed to play a masculine role, then that's like one of the worst things you can do. You know, if you tell a woman, like, get back in the kitchen, like, that's like one of the most offensive things, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of removing the masculine element from women is like the most awful thing you could do. But we haven't had a similar movement. And, and this, is, this is the piece that she doesn't say, but that I sort of mentally add. We haven't had a similar movement around men. We don't actually value the feminine in men. And in fact, we see it as weak. There's a lot of language that people use to shame men who are too feminine. You know, you're a pussy. There's, there's names that are like very derogatory to suggest that someone is gay. Um, there's a lot of things like that. And, and now we sort of begrudgingly accept it. We're like, well, if you want to be a feminine man, I guess that's okay. But we don't really value it. And, and there's no 
similar shaming language towards telling men that they have to play a masculine role. It's not, you know, if you tell a man, get back on the battlefield, like, you know, get back to work, like work and war are sort of seen as traditional masculine. Like that, if you tell a man, get back to work, that's not like, that just seems like, well, of course you tell him that. So we don't value the feminine in men. And that may be part of the reason that Western culture sees male circumcision as incredibly acceptable and female circumcision as incredibly unacceptable, which I find really like, and she, one of the things that she talks about is how these symbolic perceptions do color the, the way that we perceive this issue. You know, you don't think about that someone's perspective on this issue might be influenced by this sort of symbolic, almost religious cultural perception. Uh, and yet when you get into it, it makes a lot of sense that people perceive it that way. And then of course, you know, people ask, like, well, why aren't men more sensitive? Like why, you know, we have this sort of this weird dichotomy with men where we want them to be understanding of the feminine, nicer to the feminine. And at the same time, if they show a hint of feminine themselves, which would allow them to relate to that and in a more, uh, empathetic way, like just cut that off. That's the reaction that we have as a culture. So I found that really interesting, but at the same time, um, there wasn't really a place in the structure of the film to go on a five minute tangent about African symbolism and it would have uh, added to the budget another piece of animation. And I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't quite find a place to fit it in. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting things like that. I mean, the other decision I made in editing was that anything that was not about the question is circumcision something we should continue ended up get you know leaving the film so there's like a lot of new stuff in hiv research and the idea that there might be better methods of preventing hiv already available um but you know that the question of the film isn't how do we prevent hiv it's is circumcision something we should continue and that's sort of tangential there was a lot of stuff on what type of activism works best. And again, that's not really the question, central question of the film. Um, there was stuff on, I mean, there's stuff on a lot of, you know, there's stuff on masculinity and how we view men. And, um, but again, I just couldn't quite find the right place for it. And, and I felt like the central question was, is this something our culture should continue? Right. The uh, issue of masculinity is a really interesting one. I'm sure we'll do an episode on that um, eventually on this podcast because it's because this is long form, so we can do as much content uh, as whatever we want to as we want. Yeah. So um, we will we will probably do that. But <clears throat> it is fascinating, you know, the fact that we don't that our gender norms for women are very flexible and for men, they are not. And I was really interested when I learned that when I went to school for psychology and I have always been fascinated on that and trying to find a solution for that. Um, but yeah, again, that might be a little outside the scope of the show. Well, men have it even worse because if you're hyper masculine, then you have toxic masculinity and we'll shame that. And if you're not masculine, then you're a pussy and you're weak and we'll shame that too. So there's sort of a, a really bad dichotomy that men have now where neither is actually valued. Right. I think one way that, you know, men have it really um, bad because of this around this issue is that we actually are really seen as totally disposable and especially our bodies are seen as disposable. It's okay to, um, for men to go to war to die is acceptable. It's, it's acceptable for men to have these death professions um, and it's okay to circumcise men. And so um, one activist who I saw rever uh, review the film actually said that that was one of their problems with your film was that you showed a circumcision in your film and how could you like possibly do that when you're supposed to like be ethical and understand this issue. Um, and it's funny that that was their response because my response was the act opposite. I wondered why you showed such a gentle circumcision in your film. And um, I thought, you know, you should really show what the average procedure is since in a lot of cases, I think it's around half or something, they like don't use anesthetic anesthesia at all, much less really effective anesthesia. Um, and so double curveball there. Why did you show the procedure? Why did you show this procedure that you showed? 
Um, yeah. So I want to address the first part, actually, which is you talked about male disposability. And one of the interview subjects who I really enjoyed talking to but didn't have space for in the film was Warren Farrell, who wrote the, wrote, well, was the person who originated the concept of male disposability in his book, The Myth of Male Power. Uh, and he understands this issue and had good things to say about that, but again, beyond the scope of the film. So on the question of the circumcision that we show in the film, um, that's been really interesting to me that that's controversial because you can watch the procedure on YouTube. Like there is footage of circumcisions readily available. And, and it's also interesting to me that there is a procedure that we perform on an infant that is too shocking for adults to watch. I mean, there is, um, you know, there's, there, I've, I've even had like some potential television platforms go, oh, we, we we're interested in the film, but can you blur that scene? Like that might be too graphic for us. Um, yet it's happening to a newborn infant. So that's sort of surprising to me. Um, and as far as the procedure that we show, that procedure, I, I've been looking to film a circumcision for the movie. And I had that sort of ethical question of, you know, on the one hand, I, do, I don't want there to be a procedure that is done because of the film, yet it's happening, you know, thousands of times a day in America. And I feel that if you're going to do a film on circumcision, you need to show the procedure and be honest about what it is. It's, it, would, it would be absurd to title, put circumcision in the title of the film and then not show a circumcision. That would be, to me, it would be disingenuous. And previous, um, you know, efforts to cover the topic often have showed it, and, and showed it without controversy among activists, which is kind of interesting, interesting to me that that standard has moved, that now the procedure is seen as so offensive and so awful, you can't even show it. Um, and it's also interesting to me, too, because many times when the news shows a circumcision, they take the audio out and they put a voiceover of some news anchor saying, circumcision has been shown to prevent. And, and I, I, very often I know the archival clip they're using, and I know there are screams in that clip. The infant is screaming. So they literally silence the infant's screams to do that clip. So I looked for a while to, to hospitals to see if they would let me in to film. And I had some, some phones slammed on me, and there was a lot of avoiding. And it was the kind of thing where they basically they sort of hid behind patient confidentiality. They, well, you have to get permission from the, the parents to do it. And I know, like, they bring in a form, and they say, do you want to consent? And they sign. And it would be very easy if they wanted to cooperate to bring in, oh, by the way, there's a f some filmmakers here, and they want to film procedures that are happening. Would you consent to that, too? So it would be very easy to like have them do that. And I think that they just, they know that this looks bad and they don't want it to be seen. So, and I also, I asked a lot of uh, Moyles, Jewish ritual circumcisers, and they didn't want to be like, that was the group that was really did not want to appear on camera. In fact, I called one and I started into my thing of saying, you know, Hi, my name is Brendan. I'm a filmmaker. I'm doing a documentary on circumcision. Would you be interested? And before I can finish, he goes, no, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, well, do you mind me asking why? And he says, circumcision is, because circumcision is going to be the abortion debate of the 21st century. And then he hung up on me. <laughs> like, oh, man, you would have been a great interview subject. I really wanted that on camera, you know? <laughs> That's a great quote. Um, so I've been looking for a while. <clears throat> and then I, I called the, the doctor who, appears in my film, there was a news story on him where he, there was an incredibly high botch rate in the area that he lives. And he was making his business preparing these circumcision botches. And I knew that botches was something I wanted to cover in the film. And I thought um, that he would be a good interview subject for that. And he was uh, close to my hometown. So I was just gonna, and he was close to some other things that I wanted to film. So I, I called him up and left a message. And it wasn't until I actually took the plane flight back to interview some other people that he called me back. And he said, oh yeah, I'd love to do an interview. And while you're here, you wanna film the procedure, right? And I go, sure. Like, I've been like calling all these places trying to find it. And so I said, yes. Um, and so that was something that was already on the schedule for the day. The, the parents in that, in the, the clip that we use, they were aware of the issue. They'd even heard of the attacktivist movement. Um, they didn't care. 
that was just like, this is what we're going to do. We are hundred percent decided. And that was it. Um, and so I felt like, you know, I, it was a case where it was going to happen and I could either film it and show the world or I could not. And I sort of take the attitude towards it that I think a lot of war photographers take of, you know, we're not, we're not filming this because we are trying to promote it or endorse it. We're filming it because we think that people need to see it and know this is happening in the world. And um, as far as that particular procedure, we do show, you know, archival footage of one from the 80s where there's no anesthesia used. And that happens earlier in the film in the sequence with Soraya Mire. And, I, you know, I thought about that of, of is this um, in some way disingenuous to show? But when I interviewed pro-circumcision people like Edgar Schoen, for example, they make the argument, well, now we do it much better and we do do all those sort of uh, anesthetizing things. And, and one of the things that the doctor in that sequence actually points out is that the anesthesia takes five minutes to be effective. So very often they say we're using anesthesia, but they put the anesthesia on and then they immediately start the procedure and it's, it's not enough time for it to be effective. It is basically the same as if you were to not use it at all. So the one that is in the film is the best case scenario for a circumcision. It is someone who is aware of potential botches. It is someone who is using the necessary pain medication. And yet, and yet, when I show that scene to audiences, they tell me it's like one of the most shocking things they've ever seen. Uh, when I show it to activists who've seen the procedure before, they say, you know, that was not as bad as I was expecting. When I show it to people who've never seen the procedure, they say, that was really intense. Some people, like, that. I can always tell when that scene happens when we do a screening, because I see two or three people step outside. Um, and it's funny, too, because when I was doing test screenings with, with the film, uh, that the first version of that scene was like five minutes long and no one, no one was going to watch that. Like that was just too much. People told me they skipped that scene when they were tested watching it. So I edited it down to three minutes and people still told me they were skipping the scene. I thought well, it's way shorter now. Then I realized the audience doesn't know what they're getting into with that scene. Like that could be a 20 minute scene and they wouldn't know. So, but I don't want to short it short to like 30 seconds because if it's, you know, then people say, Oh, it was like a little 10 second scene. It doesn't seem that bad. Right. Um, so that's why there's title cards at the front of that scene that say the full procedure is 20 minutes. We're only going to show you two minutes. I'm essentially making a deal with the audience. I'm pre-framing it for them. Like, this is what I'm going to show you. Know that it's longer than that, but this is it. And it's also for the people who know they can't watch it. They know two minutes. I'm going to step outside the theater for two minutes. That's it. Um, so those were the decisions I made with that scene. But I understand uh, I understand why some people would be so offended by what they see that they want to shoot the messenger. And I also understand why so some people might um, think that it is so horrendous that we need to make it appear even, you know, like we need to show the most horrendous version so that people understand that that's what it is. I, I, I understand those, both those perspectives. And I think that the fact that we've gotten both of them um, meant that we, found the right spot in the middle. Yeah, I really appreciated um, the fact that you did um, say, you know, we're gonna show this procedure. If you need to not watch it, then, you know, skip this part. Because I know a lot of people have <clears throat> uh, pretty severe trauma and a lot of that actually comes often from watching the procedure, um, especially a more severe um, representation of the procedure that often happens. Um, and so I think that was really, really good. And again, I'm also, I appreciate that you did include it in the film. I think, you know, I've heard a lot of people say before that what persuaded them after hearing all these facts and all these ideas about it, um, even stories, was just simply seeing it was really what did it for them. It's like, it's so um, visceral to see what actually happens. And most people really don't. It doesn't, you know, it's a little snip, right? It's, they don't get that it's actually not that at all. That's also why there's a dramatization at the opening. I, I thought that if we're going to have a conversation about circumcision, we should be clear on what it is. And I think that a lot of people have that idea that it's a little snip. They think the image they have in their minds is that a doctor takes a pair of scissors and goes like this. And that's the entire procedure. They don't realize there's a circumstrate, there's these clamps, they're tied down. It is a 20-minute involved thing. 
And so I felt like I wanted to put that at the beginning of the film before, like, before we can have an intellectual conversation among adults, we need to acknowledge what the perspective of the child is. And so with that opening sequence, I, you know, I also knew like if I show the procedure in the beginning, that's going to be too much for most people. I and mean, that's really intense. They're not ready for that. So that's why the dramatization is also at the beginning of the film where we show the lead up to the procedure and we help you understand like what the infant's perspective in all of this is. You know, a lot of the times when the procedure's filmed, it's a, the, a, an adult sets up a camera on a tripod and they tilt it down and it's an adult perspective watching it. And what I want to do is take the camera and bring it down to eye level with the person it's actually happening to. Like, what is this person's perspective of the situation? Right. It's a very um, spine chilling opening. So I appreciate that. And that, that was shown also in the, the trailers. Um, and so another thing I want to go into is um, how people actually receive this film. So you went on tour with it. You showed at the Genital Integrity Symposium at... Um, you know, various different venues and places. Um, your parents came to one of them. You know, you had every different activist who's been in the film. You had um, all these different places you've shown it, and you've probably had a lot of reactions. Um, I'm curious what sort of reactions are most common? What's the range? What's the experience people have uh, when they see your film? Um, it really is a range of reactions and it's interesting. I, we are, I know we're recording this before the film is out. I don't know if you are okay with me revealing that, but I just did. Yeah. Um, so I assume that there'll probably be even more reactions over the course of the VOD release, but during the tour, um, it really, yeah, it's a range of responses. It's, it kind of depends on how much knowledge a person has going in. But I think that one of the challenges I had with the film was getting everyone on the same emotional page because people are coming into this film. Some of them have massive amounts of knowledge and some of them have almost no, almost you know, nothing about the topic. And that's part of the reason why we start the way that we do is with something that is purely visceral and easy to understand on a human emotional level um, to sort of get everyone on the same emotional page. But I, it's interesting, like there is a range of responses and I think that by the end, everyone who has seen it understands that this is a serious issue. And, you know, again, it's, it's, there's the, the difference also tends to be emotional, um, there are certain scenes that everyone seems to cry during and there are certain scenes that uh, seem to get a laugh every time. And I've seen the film with enough audiences that I can kind of know where those are. And they vary a little bit depending on the, on the audience. Um, you know, for example, when we're talking about some of the Victorian ideas about masturbation and circumcision, uh, a rowdier audience will give that more of a laugh. Actually, the one audience that responded differently than all the others was the symposium audience because they, that's the most educated, you know, most knowledgeable audience on this. And they sort of uh, very strongly identify with certain characters and are rooting for them because that's their perspective and very strongly dislike other characters. So they were, they were probably the rowdiest audience that, and they would also, uh, you know, spontaneously applaud during certain parts. Um, it's funny, Marilyn Milos, who is one of the main characters of the film, Run, you know, this was her last symposium, and so the moment she appeared on screen, I was I was standing outside the screening because uh, I usually you know, I've seen the film before. I don't always stay inside for them. And seven minutes in, I hear this huge applause. I'm like, what are you applauding for it? Seven minutes in the film. I go, oh, Marilyn just came on screen. So it's you know her last symposium, and a lot of people there in support of her. So the moment she comes on screen, they're just like, yeah, like. Uh, so so yeah, I think that the response varies a little bit during, to, to knowledge level and how much of a shock it is. And some people have a little more shock than others. Some people have a little more grief than others, depending on what decision they've made. Um, some people feel, feel very positive because feelings that they've had a long time have finally been confirmed by a larger, a larger piece of media. Um, but it's been mostly positive. And then the people who don't like it, who, um, 
like there tends to, it's not I, I don't know that I've gotten a lot of um, dislike of the film as much as dislike of having to engage with the film it's just like why'd you make me feel that I don't want to feel that like what do you, you know it's like sort of this like resistance to even engaging with it um, and it's funny because uh, again I, there may there's probably going to be more reviews by the time this is out um, but that is the thing that I have noticed from from negative reviews is there's this like it's it's almost like they watched a different film because they don't really want to engage with the film that they actually saw. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, that was a really interesting thing in the uh, one negative review that I read. Um, it was it was the exact sort of conflict that you mentioned earlier of feeling versus you know just trying to come at it from a logical perspective, and they're like, you know, you totally ignored all of the science and it was just all feeling and I don't know how anyone who respects the scientific me method could watch this. And it was really interesting to hear that because like I look back and I've, I've watched the film a couple of times now and it's like you actually went really deep into the science and explained. <laughs> yeah, we literally have scientific studies scrolling across the screen. <laughs> yeah. And so um, it is just, it's really interesting to see people's reactions and how their own personal psychology plays out. He also said in that review, by the way, that he was very, very offended that uh, people who have their whole genitals refer to themselves as intact. Um, <laughs> I just laughed out loud at it. It's like, you're offended that someone else calls themselves something? I, I, I just, I, I was confused. Um, I love those reviews. I get really entertained by them. It was fun. I kind of want some more reviews like that, just so that I can continue to be entertained. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get a lot. So. Yeah, they're coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'd like to say I brought my uh, brother to the film, to the Denver screening, which was awesome. He, um, he said it was the best documentary he's ever seen, and he wants to start restoring. And um, so, yeah, I cool. think it was a positive, positive response. And um, uh, I'm curious um, how your family, your parents responded to the film. Uh, they have had all of the years I've been making the film to respond to it and learn about it. So their perspective of, on it has evolved over time. And, you know, an audience has under two hours to receive all this information and they've had a little while. So I think when I initially started, uh, they didn't really get it. Um, my dad, you know, he's a bit more of a peacemaker. And so he sort of thought, well, if you're making this film, you must not like the decision that we made. And I'm sorry about that. Um, and he, but he, I don't even think he really understood why I felt the way that I did. And my mom was much more resistant. Um, and over the course of six years, they've sort of been getting pieces of information as I interview people. Um, my dad told me that one of the things that actually made him think about this issue a little more was when he learned that a, a curvature of the penis is not actually natural. That, that hat, that's a type of circumcision botch where someone removes more skin on one side than the other, so it causes that bend. Um, and he knew someone in high school who had that. And that was like a thing that clicked in his mind of like, oh, like that's not normal. There's a reason for that. Um, and I think, too, that the, their fear was that me exploring this issue would be a reason for disconnection. That because I was feeling what I was feeling and because I was learning what I was learning, that that would mean that they couldn't have a relationship with me anymore. And that that was the real fear. So the fact that they have seen that that is not the case, that I'm not going to break connection over this, they've been willing to explore a lot of the information. And even I showed them an early edit of the film and they had some good feedback and they understood it. And, and they said like, you know, this, this might change a lot of people's minds. Like this might, this might, have an impact out in the world. Um, but I think that that when it, you know, when it comes to 
uh, dealing with parents is the challenge. I think a lot of parents feel like this is that if their, their child says that something they did was wrong, that that is a threat to the relationship. And so um, because they have seen that it's not going to cause me to break connection, it might cause me to, you know, leave my space sometimes. But it's the fact that it's not going to cause me to break connection makes them a little safer. Um, and I also think that, you know, parents have a strong desire to be part of their kids. And so the fact that it's being successful, they, they have this uh, it's a little bit of like a, a moat confusion of like, well, we're really proud of you, but it does kind of make us look bad. <laughs> so uh, I, I can feel both of those from them. Mm. And uh, I think that the, the pride is winning out in the end. So. <clears throat> Um, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, my, um, my parents position has definitely evolved over time, um, as well. And it's definitely like that, having that patience, being able to just, you know, give them a little bit of information here, like have multiple discussions, um, you know, doing my own healing work so that I can really be able to have that patience and ability to manage my emotions enough to talk to them about it um, has been invaluable. Um, and I actually have a specific question for you on this. Um, uh, I could use some advice. Um, so my, my uh, mom is a family practice doctor and um, in the, um, process of making daily videos. One of them that I made that was one of my most popular, much to my chagrin, was talking to my circumcising mom. Um, and so, um, you know, it's been it's been painful to have be like continuously reminded of that. People who are following my channel have like asked about it more, and I'm like, I don't want to like think about it because like I'm trying to, you know, I've showed her. Elephant in the hospital. I've showed her my podcast. I've showed her Eric Clopper's sex and circumcision. I'm definitely going to show her this documentary. Um, but at some point, I'm, uh, you know, I asked her a little bit about conscious objection. She said she'd kind of thought about it, but it might be a little of a bit of a challenge. Uh, I know you didn't cover that in your film, but it's something that you, I think you said you would have liked to have covered. Um, we had a sequence on it that'll probably be in the deleted scenes. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, as I'm probably gonna have another conversation with her soon, what your, if you have any ideas on that or any suggestions, any thoughts? Um, so why would she not take that route? What's her reluctance there? Uh, she said that it's, you know, it's, it's like a lot of social pressure from the other doctors around her saying, um, you know, if she doesn't do it, then someone else is going to have to come in and do it. And it's, I think, also partly just the discomfort of, like, talking to patients and trying to explain that. You know, she understands that it's bad now and will say, like, you don't really need to do it. But if she actually has to say no, I think that's, like, another um, step for her. You know, I think this is a challenge for doctors of framing. And there's two parts to this. There's whatever sort of emotional feelings she might have around the issue. And to me, the idea, um, well, I, I don't know if I can tell my patients no. I think that's kind of a cop-out. Doctors are actually incredibly good at persuasion. They have people come into their office who are paying them a lot of money to tell them their opinion, to tell them their expertise. Like on any other issue, they would say, I'm the doctor. This is what I think the best treatment is. This is what we do here. Um, if a patient came in and wanted any other part of their child removed, they would just very easily say no. If a patient came in and said they wanted their daughter circumcised, they would very easily say no. And so I think that part of the challenge that doctors have is that this issue has been framed to them so much in a particular way that they don't see how easy it would be to reframe a different way. So imagine, imagine that you are the doctor and someone comes into your office the, and they say, I want to have my child circumcised. Um, the, the, 
way that a doctor might say no now, if they were to assume their old framing would be, well, we don't do that here. We don't, you don't need to do it. I don't know if it's right. Um, these are all negatives. These are pointing towards the thing that you don't do. And, and when, you, when you frame it in a negative, it's a bit like saying, don't think about a purple elephant. Like, what do you think about, you know? Um, so you're talking in the language you are using points towards harm and, uh, you know, malfeasance on the part of doctors. And th those are not things you want associated with your brand as a doctor, right? You want to talk about in positive. So here's how you'd frame it as a positive. Someone comes into your office, they say, we want to have your child circumcised. You say, our office practices the highest standard of care. And it used to be that doctors thought that circumcision was a thing that you needed to do. And now our, our scientific and our knowledge and our thinking on this has evolved. And so we understand that this isn't a procedure you need to do. And in fact, um, could actually lead to complications for your child. It could reduce their amount of sensitivity. You know, you, then you go into all this stuff and you say, but our office practices the highest standard of care. And there are other offices you could go to. There's other doctors you could go to who would happily take your money and charge you for things that you don't need because doctors make money on things that they do, not things that they don't do. But if you want to work with a doctor who has the highest ethical standing, who's going to work for your interests as a patient and say no to you, even when it goes against their financial interests, you should come to our office. And that's my profession, as a high, or my, my opinion as a highly trained professional that you don't need to do this for your child and you would actually be doing a disservice if you were to do that. Now again, if you want to work with uh, people who want to just take your money, you can do that, that's totally fine. But our office is going to practice the highest standard of care. Right. You feel how, how different that frame is yeah. and how it points to how it points to their office and the positives of their office and what's important about the work that they do. And I think that doctors have just never approached it that way in terms of framing as the, uh, you know, the, the positives of this. And then, you know, you're, you're like, if you want to give your patients more information, you say, you know, there's a great documentary out that's on this. There's these, this stuff on YouTube, whatever it is you want to say. Um, but that way you, you frame it in terms of the positives. And again, like, I think that doctors, when they think about this issue, they think about saying no to it, not saying yes to a very high standard of care and ethics for their patients. Right. It reminds me, too, of, um, you know, how we've changed in terms of getting tonsils removed. You know, we used to do that routinely. If, I think if someone came These in are great comparisons. and wanted to remove their child's tonsils preventatively, she'd probably say, no, we don't, we don't do that right. anymore. You know, it's just... <laughs> That makes sense. Um, it's just a question of framing it in terms of the positive rather than the negative. And this, by the way, this is what the intactivist movement went through in its own internal uh, presentation. It used to be an anti-circumcision movement. And again, you know, they would have, they'd have signs that had like the pictures of the procedure and these very sort of gross and, you know, controversial things that are sort of shocking. And there was a, a movement that happened within that movement of, well, what if we, instead of framing ourselves as anti-circumcision, framed ourselves as pro-intact? Mm -hmm. you know, we are for the whole baby. We are for, what, what if we, and you, know, and you see a lot of pictures now that have smiling, happy babies and take your whole child home. And this idea that this is a movement that is about uh, the best for children and the men that they become. Right. That makes a lot of sense, too, in terms of like social change research that really shows that when you have a positive message, uh, much like Foragen does, that we can regenerate the human foreskin, that it's really valuable, that it feels really, really good and provides these sexual functions and that we can get you that back. Um, messages like that are actually often a lot easier to spread than, you know, this horrible thing happened. Um, like, sorry, but don't do it anymore. Yeah, um, I think that doctors mm -hmm. have not had this presented in a similar way. They're still in the conscientious objection frame, which is about what you don't do, as opposed mm -hmm. to what they're for. And if they actually frame it in terms of what they're for, then not only does it allow them to say no to this procedure, but it actually could even be almost a marketing gimmick of like those other doc. you know, if we are, this is the movement for the highest patient care, the highest ethical standards. And if you just want people, because people know that you know, doctors get paid to do all sorts of things that are against the patient's interest. They prescribe 
things that big pharma wants that maybe don't actually help the patient. They use medical devices that, um, uh, you know, that they can charge for and things like that. And so when you frame it that way, now all those other doctors are not as good as our practice. And it actually frames you as the best practice in town. Right. Awesome. Um, well, I'll talk to my mom. Uh, my brother's wedding is at the end of this month. And so Congrats. I'm getting at it. And we'll be there with her uh, driving up together. So um, I also think it'd be really interesting to like do a screening for her hospital and like show this movie so like people can understand why she's taking that position. Yeah. Maybe educate some other doctors. No, I think that'd be, I don't know if that would be possible, but just an idea. Sure. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but some critics have said, you know, they don't think that anyone's going to ever see this film, and so it's not going to really matter. Um, and one of our viewers actually asked, you know, is there a plan to sort of increase or um, maintain at least the momentum of the film once it's released? Is there any um, marketing you're doing or any, what's, what's kind of the strategy there? Yeah, that, I don't know. I always, I, I find that a little absurd in the idea that, I mean, just, just look at Amazon as the world's third largest search engine. And if you put circumcision into Amazon right now, you get a couple books and you know, they're good books, but they're books. Uh, and circumcision training kits. And, and like, that's the, that's what's out there right now. Um, so I think that we'll get a lot just from search. And, and my attitude towards this issue is that you want to, the, you know, you want to be on the platforms that people have their attention. on. Mm-hmm. You, you go where the attention is. And right now there is nothing on most major platforms on this issue. There isn't stuff on, um, there isn't stuff on Amazon. There's not stuff on, on most video platforms. So, you know, the places we are, um, there's, there's not a lot on like target or Barnes and Noble or, you know, things like that. And now there is, and, and, and this is going to be the first result that comes up on those. So I think that even if we weren't to do anything, we'd still get a lot of attention there. Now, obviously, um, I'm not just going to do that. My plan is, again, to go where people's attention is. So the attention that, that people have is largely on social media. So we're always creating content that you can share on social media. There are uh, still quote memes from the film. There are trailers. I will probably take podcasts like this and start to pull clips from them that I share on my own social media so that People have things they can share there too. I mean, one thing I feel like I really understand is social media marketing. And it is the kind of thing where uh, it takes a lot of work. I would, I'm always looking for good people who can help with that. But it is something I know how to do. And you know, it's funny too, because at every stage of the film, people have made criticisms like that. They've been like, well, how are you going to make the film? And it's like, I don't know. I'll figure it out. Like, that's just sort of what I said at the time. And they're like, well, how are you going to fund it? I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And then we have like a massive crowdfunding campaign, right? Um, people ask, like, how are you going to film a circumcision? Like, how are you going to do that? I'm just like, we'll figure it out. Like, I, I believe this is something worth doing, and I will find a way, and I have absolute faith in my own problem-solving skills. Um, and at every stage, we've, you know, we've gotten done. And then it's funny, too, because, you know, we do it, and then people go like, well, you know, like, how are you going to film a circumcision? That was the question we always get. And they're like, well, why did you film a circumcision? Why did you film a different type? And it's, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think that these questions come from, people who aren't doing the work. Like when you're committed to doing the work, it's not a question of, of if that's going to happen. It's just, I'm going to keep trying things until it does. So for me, I, I, I'm just going to the platforms where people are paying attention and creating content there. So we are on social media. I am doing interviews with traditional press. I am doing interviews with podcasts and places like this. Um, I am doing... Uh, trying to set up some larger um, traditional media appearances. And again, uh, I don't want to talk too much about that because by the time this is out, it, there could be something different there. But, you know, we're, we're going to the places where people are paying attention. And then on top of that, there's a couple other um, 
stunt sort of things I could do to get attention. I'm still debating how much of that I want to do. But I think that when people are going to have a child, I mean, this is what a lot of activists have told me. This is how they became interested in it. They search everything. They go on like, it used to be that when you, when you were going to make this decision, you talk to your doctor and that was kind of the only place you could get it. You know, maybe if you were really high agency, you'd go to the library and do some research. But like, who does that? Now, you pull out your phone, you take two seconds, you put a search into, um, you know, whatever search engine you use and, and you pull stuff up. Or you post something about it on social media and all your friends respond. So I, I think that we're going to get a lot of traction through both of those, through search, because again, there's not a lot of content created on this issue, and through word of mouth. Just people are going to tell, tell other people about it. Um, so that's my plan there, and there are the potential for a few big viral things or breakthrough moments, but I think it is just a repetition of attention on the platforms that matter. Right. Um, as I've said before, you know, please share this with all your friends. That's what I'm going to do. Please. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing that we have this now. Like we haven't had something this powerful ever to share with people. And, um, you know, it comes across as balanced. It comes across as gentle. It's logical. It's, it's everything that I would want and something that I can share with the people I care about who I want to make a good decision around this or just to, you know, throw it out as many people as possible and some of them will pick it up, some won't, but uh, there's no harm in, you know, spreading it far and wide, so. Um. I, I think that the key on this issue in general is repetition. If you look at, look at the friends of yours who do not follow politics or current events in any way. If you were to ask them about major issues, if you were to ask them about climate change, or issues around race, or issues around the president, um, they probably have some semblance of an idea and be able to tell you like, oh yeah, that's like a thing and they give you a little bit about it. I mean, actually even look at, look at uh, religion, for example. Like if you ask someone what Christians believe or what Jews believe or what Muslims believe, they can give you like kind of a basic definition even if they've never talked to someone for whom that's their faith, or if they don't believe that themselves. And like, why do they know that? They know it's sort of picked up through cultural osmosis. It's just been repeated so much in media and press that they've just, like, they picked it up. And if, it's funny, like, if you ask people about circumcision, they'll tell you things like, oh, it's, you know, it, it's cleaner, it'll give you these various cultural myths, but like, where did they learn that? They didn't, ever sit down and watch something like that. So it just repeated enough through the media. And now, by the way, when I talk to people um, and I ask them about this issue, they go, oh, yeah, that's really controversial. Like that's the viewpoint because it's been repeated enough. There's been enough work done that that's you know, the perspective. So I feel like that repeated exposure more than any one moment or thing is the key. Although many people have told me again, there is one moment that convinced them. There's a moment that, that it switched. And I think that a lot of time that comes from like something gets in your mind and it won't leave you. One of the, um, one of the festival programmers who accepted our film to their film festival said that when he saw the, the movie, he was thinking about it days later. And you have to understand someone who programs film for festivals uh, might watch eight films a day. Like they're, they're just watching one after another. They get like 300 submissions to the festival. They got to pick which one they're going to put in. So for him to be thinking about one of the films he saw days later, this is like a light bulb for him of like, oh, this is an important film. Like I should make sure this is in our festival. So, and I think that there's the potential for that too. When people see this, that I, a lot of people, have, you know, they'll email me a week after a screening and say, I'm still thinking about it. Like it's still in my mind. It's like the repetition is occurring inside them, even though they only saw it once. Right. What did you, did you learn anything in the process of making this film? Did it sort of transform you in any way? I think the biggest thing that it did was give me a really deep interest in human consciousness and why people think the way that they do. Because when I started, I thought, well, I'll just present people with information and then they'll understand the information and then they'll get it. And of course, that's not the way that people work at all. People are not particularly rational um, when it's something that they care about. So what I found with there was that there were these really strange emotional reactions people would have to the subject matter in film. They would, um, 
they're almost like try to throw these things out to like avoid learning new information. They were really scared of what this topic might bring up for them. And so that, that was the thing that I became curious about was, okay, like what's going on here emotionally? Like what is this other thing that's happening? And that led to me studying uh, psychology and persuasion and human consciousness and all sorts of things around that. So I think that, that was the biggest change that happened. And the other thing that, you know, again, when I started, I sort of felt like, and I first, or first discovered that fact about human consciousness, I sort of felt like, God, like that's, that's felt really insurmountable that I, that like all the data and facts in the world couldn't persuade certain people. But once I started to understand the, the emotional components happening and the psychological components happening, I actually realized, oh, it's, it's, it's actually not that hard. People are capable of change if you're willing to engage with them emotionally and deal with the parts of them and the feelings that they have that are non-rational. Right. I feel like um, persuasion is largely providing people with the truth, you know, just telling them, as you said, the facts of it, but then also presenting that in a palatable way, in a way that works. Um, so... Is that kind of how you've approached it or what, what, and also just like brought more broadly on this issue if, if people are wanting to make change on it, um, what is it that they need to do to have effect? You said repetition is important, you know, just getting it to the point where it breaks through somehow. Um, but is there anything else in terms of framing or in terms of how you um, present it to people? Is it just kind of presenting those emotions? I, I feel like it's actually first figuring out where someone is around this mm. issue. Like the, the, uh, the best activists that I have seen are really good listeners. When they meet someone and they bring up this issue, they're really listening. There's one woman, um, Karen, who actually, she, in her day-to-day her -day life, she works with animals. And so because she works with animals, she's really good at reading those nonverbal cues that they have. And I have seen her when she's talking to someone, she's reading their body language. She knows when to take a step back and give them a little space and back off. And she knows when it's okay to come closer. And that I feel like is actually the key is being willing to know where someone is. And, and again, by the way, you, you're asking about your mom earlier. I would be really curious about where she is currently emotionally with this issue. You know, is there, is there guilt that she's done this procedure? Is there, um, fear about what it would mean for her practice is there you know like i i don't know what the emotions are there um but i feel like if when you're talking to someone it's really important to listen to them and to know and acknowledge them and once you acknowledge if once you acknowledge and accept where someone is then you can lead them somewhere new but you're not gonna uh lead them somewhere new if they're if, the, if you don't acknowledge first where they are you know, you, I mean, some people you can, they're open to being led, but of most people, you first need to tell them like where you are is okay. And I acknowledge that. And, and then they're, they're willing to join you somewhere. new. Hmm. So I, I feel like listening is the main thing. And then as far as what people should do on this issue, that sort of just depends on what you're good at, what you love. Like I love filmmaking. That's what I've wanted to do my whole life. For, for you, it may be something different. Um, I, I hear activists debate what strategy would work best and, you know, should we do legal stuff? Should we do media stuff? And just depend, like, that's going to be a very individual question because I might intellectually decide, oh, legal stuff is the best way to go, but I'm not a lawyer. That's not what I love doing. And if I was to try to, to go that route, it would be really painful for me because it it's just not what I love. Um, likewise, someone who is really good, at, for example, organizing groups of people, if they tried to make a film and they don't love filmmaking, it might be a little difficult. Whereas like, if you're really good at organizing people, that's an incredible, like that's every, all the best activists in the world, like go that route, you know? Right. Um, it just depends what you love. Okay, cool. Uh, that answer surprised me a little bit, the uh, listening. Um, and I like that one because it, makes sense from what I've experienced 
and um yeah that's what i've heard from some some of my favorite people who are really good at talking this who have talked about a lot to a lot of people and jillian longley who's in your film yeah says you know really listen to them see where they're at another friend of mine lawrence um you know says it's it's really hard to explain to me how to talk to it he's a rideshare driver as well and talks to a lot of passengers and it's like well you have to like feel where they're at like it's like when do i introduce the topic it's like well you can say it like when they ask what else do you do besides this or is this your main job i say well i also do a podcast um <laughs> and but over time i've learned really it's you know about actually just seeing where people are at asking them questions um you know saying it's about foreskin regeneration and then that's just ask it, what do you think about that rather than trying yeah. to explain it all um that usually leads to long awkward silences right <laughs> you're so. also giving them the opportunity to determine what sort of conversation they want to have mm -hmm. so the, then if, the, if there's a conversation that happens about it it's because they asked the questions and invited you to talk about it it's not you pushing past their boundaries in any way yeah um that sensitivity sensitivity to where people are at awesome thank you for that um yeah uh so i'd like to go into the psychology of this and then talk a little bit about foraging <clears throat> but um first i'd like to take a little sort of um comic relief break and do a new segment i want to call the quick question speed round so i have a few okay. very brief questions um and yeah let's let's go for it i think you'll be able to answer these all pretty quickly okay so, first of all netflix can't talk about it yet all right. <laughs> what do you prefer, being interviewed or being interviewee? Depends on the interviewer. This one. I'm enjoying the interview. Yeah. I like <laughs> awesome. This is a little easier for me because I get to be lazy and just, I mean, everyone loves talking about themselves. So. All right. Um, think you'll, I guess you already answered, think you'll ever write a book? Yeah. Cool. Maybe um, more than one. Look forward to it what's the other ones so before i did this film i really loved creative fiction i the films that i was looking at making were you know horror and sci-fi and superhero and stuff like that and i have some uh fiction work that i might do at some point awesome and there's also some other topics and and issues that are important to me and i might write something about those cool yeah. um do you hope to be a father one day? Yes. Uh, what um, is the thing that you hate most about circumcision? Uh, ignorance and the amount of invalidating people's emotions that occurs around it. Hmm. Who is the most underrated or up and coming voice in the intactivist movement? Uh, Eric Klopper and Ashley Truman. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, favorite character in your movie? Oh man, you're asking me to pick favorites? Yes, I am. Actually, no. I'm gonna give a. I'm gonna give an unusual answer for that. Uh, Fuwambai. Okay. I like. I like her. The the woman in the film who is uh, talks about you know female circumcision positively because. She triggers everyone in the audience <laughs> and makes all of them rethink their beliefs. Troublemaker I, in you. I know. I, I have a little of that. Uh, but, like, I, I like that. No matter what your – like, every Western perspective, when she, like, when she comes on, goes like, what? And there's actually – part of the reason there's a title card in the midst of her scene is that um, when I first showed that to a test audience, they were like, wait, so she – believes what like they literally even though she directly says it to to the camera they literally couldn't accept that that was her perspective so i have to like pause and tell the audience like <laughs> she did just say what you, you thought she said yes um so yeah I, I i i appreciate her perspective that's great i am um, she's actually the one i learned most from in the movie um knowing a lot about this issue i don't know a lot about fe female circumcision but 
<clears throat> or female genital mutilation, whatever you choose to call it. But um, like hearing her perspective was really um, informative to me on an emotional level, like just seeing that, oh yeah, like there are actually women who say the exact same thing, like most women probably say the exact same thing that men say around this issue. Um, a lot of men at least who are, you know, say they're happy that they're circumcised. So do women say the same thing? Like it's, it's um, kind of discombobulating certainly. So yeah. it's cool to actually hear someone talk about that. Um, and one last question, if you weren't a filmmaker, what would you be? Uh, I'd probably be a healer of some kind. Um, oh, I know what I'd be. I'd be a hypnotist. <laughs> nice. Yep. Cool. Love to be hypnotized by you sometime. So, I am actually <laughs> trained in hypnosis, so that is a thing that I can do. I don't feel like uh, I don't I don't feel comfortable taking people on in a therapeutic way, but I can do fun hypnosis. Sweet. Yep. I'm down. <laughs> All right. So um, you say that this issue is a lot about what people allow themselves to feel. I'm wondering uh, if you've had any help feeling what you feel psychologically around this issue um, and how your feelings about it have kind of evolved over time. Um, if there's been any like healing process for you. So I am always doing um, various practices to better understand myself and my own consciousness and have been since before I started this film. My first interest was meditation. I had a lot of anger when I was younger and I found that when I sat with that anger, there was less anger and I started seeing what emotions were underneath the anger. Um, since then I have studied all sorts of things around human consciousness more than I could list here. And what I have found when it comes to healing things, or at least uh, things that occur during the time period that this occurs, is that somatic methods get there a little quicker. This is not something that you can uh, reach through talk therapy, traditional talk therapy. I mean, it is possible to deal with some of the feelings that way, but um, I don't know that talk therapy is that effective, to be honest. The, hmm, I'm not sure how much I should go into around my, my own personal process. There's, there's a lot that I could say, but it would also be getting into some of the territory that a book might later. So I might have to save that for, for later. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm being a tease right now, but. You're just trying to get us to buy all your content. I mean, I do, I do want people to see the film. Like, you should, yeah. You should, you should get all my content. It's good content. That's true. <laughs> Damn it, Brendan. All right. Um, so, um, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, the original question was on, on healing processes that worked, right? Yes. And if you have any experience or, but... Uh, the two things that I have heard of working are somatic therapies, things that are purely about the body. Mm -hmm. So, and there's like a whole range of those. There's stuff that kind of gets towards primal therapy. There's things that are um, about releasing stuff from like pressure points in the body. There's sort of almost massage based methods, but uh, stuff that deals with it on a physical level. Um, and the other is methods that involve trance states. So things like uh, rebirthing, things like regression hypnosis, things like Teal Swan's completion process. Um, I've had a lot of experience with that last one, and I've found it incredibly effective for things like this. And things that allow, that puts you in a state where you're able to access early life memories or early life feelings. Um, I actually, I should break that down a little bit because I think a lot of people are going to take issue with what I just said and not understand it. So when we talk about uh, somatic memory, 
or early life memory. I think a lot of people jump on that concept as something that could not be possibly true because, you know, I don't remember what happened when I was a baby, right? That's like not something that I walk around thinking about each day. And they assume that the memory that we are talking about is like story memory, like the memory you have of what you ate for breakfast yesterday. So when you think about your memories now, there's a narrative to them. Like I, yesterday I did this and then I went here and then I went here and then I did that. And somatic memory is a little different. So your dog does not remember what it ate for breakfast yesterday. You ask your dog to tell you a story that showed memory the way that you and I have memory and think about memory now, it wouldn't be able to do that, right? Yet, um, if your dog suffered abuse, if you were to like beat your dog with a rolled up newspaper, and then you reach for a rolled up newspaper, it flinches, it gets, it gets uncomfortable. Your dog also, when you come home, is excited to see you. It remembers you. Yet at the same time, it doesn't have this narrative memory. You're, what's going on? Like your dog does have memory, but it's a somatic memory. It's memory that is conditioned through behavior. So the memories that you have, you know, are uh, from early life are not verbal memories. They're not memories like you think about what you did yesterday. They're somatic memories and if you were to hurt an infant early in life there is a change in behavior and that has been scientifically studied and proven and the most pro-circumcision person in our film acknowledges those studies as factual and true so they're, they're the tadio pain studies that we talk about in the film where children who were uh, vaccinated and who, who were circumcised reacted much more traumatically and strongly to vaccines because when they felt pain they had the re from the you know a vaccine needle they were reacting with the memory of receiving pain earlier and the researchers attribute this to post traumatic stress disorder and again like you, you tell people that and they go oh that's not possible when even the most pro circumcision researcher acknowledges that now you might say uh, that that memory is, is, you know, well, that's different than the memory we have now. But at the same time, like, you wouldn't beat your dog with a rolled up newspaper because, quote, he won't remember, right? That there is an acknowledged change in behavior there. So that is also the reason why uh, somatic healing methods and trance-based healing methods tend to get at this more because you're not dealing, you know, talk therapy can deal with a narrative memory. A memory of like this is what happened yesterday and you know my relationship with my significant other is having these problems but it's not going to get at those like really somatic memories mm. yeah i um <clears throat> as i said on the last podcast i was going to create a program for men who are um traumatized and i now have a beta version of that also on my jordan Arell youtube channel um circumcision trauma healing daily where I kind of go through daily exercises that go through that. And that's, um, that is basically what we do. It's, it's going into those emotions, those feelings, the physical experience, and that's stored all in your neurons, in your, in your body physically. And by working through it, um, sort of massaging out those, there's actually a physical scar massage of the circumcision scar. There's, um, lots of different ways that you can kind of approach this and start to work through those feelings, work through those somatic experiences. So that's certainly also um, my experience with this. And, um, and yeah, it's for me, I, I will say, you know, that's, I had pretty severe PTSD around this and it really helped me to, to do a lot of, of that stuff and I continue doing it. And um, so I, I really appreciate that you've mentioned before that that's, you know, an important thing for a lot of guys is acknowledging those feelings are there and then doing something to uh, work through them. Um, I know some, a lot of activists say that they do um, mainly activism as their therapy. <clears throat> and actually one thing I'd like to go into is, so you, you did the, the film in memory of Jonathan Conte, who is a um, voice in your film. And um, I'm curious what 
was your experience of that like when he took his own life um uh and kind of how did that affect you and how did that affect the film yeah it's one of those things that i did not see coming but in retrospect is kind of clear and um for those who don't know, Jonathan is a character in the film, but he's also was sort of what many people thought of when they thought of intactivism. He was one of the people who was out there protesting the most. And I think that looking back, um, you know, when, when someone ends their life, it is never just the circumstances that they're in. It is the circumstances plus the belief they have about those circumstances. And, and the two beliefs that are most likely to cause something like this are feeling powerless, feeling like this situation will never change, and feeling completely alone in it. And unfortunately, because society invalidates a lot of the feelings that men have around this issue, they feel a lot more alone in this than they actually are. And I know that Jonathan struggled a lot with the fact that people would acknowledge, not acknowledge the feelings that he had. Um, and he especially, um, I mean, I know, I know some personal things about his situation and things with his family that I don't know that I should get into here, but there was a lot of, a lot of not acknowledging that occurred in his life. And on top of that, he had been protesting this issue for several years and did not feel like there was a lot of change. Um, he saw a lot of evidence for people uh, invalidating the feelings that he had around this issue. So, you know, obviously when he did that, uh, there was a lot of shock initially. There was a lot of grief. Um, and to be honest, I feel like there has been also a lot of emotional bypassing in people's reaction to that. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, this idea like, well, we've got to just keep fighting and doing what we've been doing. It's even more important now. And I actually think that there needs to be a uh, greater acknowledgement of, of what happened, of, that it is not just, um, like I'll say, I don't think activism as therapy works. Jonathan was the one who, you know, said that idea the most and it did not work out for him. I think you actually have to do therapy. You do therapy as your therapy, not just activism as your therapy. And that if you are using activism as your therapy, you are asking strangers to do the therapy for you. You're asking them to reflect uh, something about this issue. That you want them to acknowledge how you feel. And you're going to get a lot further if you acknowledge and be present with your own feelings or you find someone who is a practitioner who is willing to be present with your feelings. So I, when I talk to someone about this issue, I am there to share something with them. I am not there to get something from them. And I think that that is an important distinction and that you will get a lot better reaction from people when they can feel that you're not trying to use them to heal your own wounds. Right. Yeah. That's, um, very interesting in my experience. As I said, I, I really did all of my healing work and be before that I wasn't even able to like, uh, do anything around this issue. I tried to do a little bit and did, um, a little bit of activism, very minor, but I, it was just too difficult for me. And so but now as I've continued doing more and more healing work, it just gets easier. And actually I feel I'm able to be much more effective. So I can definitely attest to <clears throat> my ability to just have more energy and to be more um, present, less. That's interesting though. I hadn't really thought about that, like less needy in a way, like needing a certain reaction, but that also definitely makes sense. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. I also appreciate very much your, again, your focus on self-development. I think it really shows in your film that you're someone who's allowed himself to feel all of the feel feelings around this issue in every area. Um, and then present those and present all of the arguments and counter arguments and 
um, really show that with complete clarity. Um, I'm also curious about one other thing in the film. So uh, Edgar Schoen in the film, uh, as you asked him, you know, what his opinion about men who are angry around circumcision uh, is, and he said, you know, they should get a life. Like they should kind of just get over it and like find some other reason for their problems. Um, did you have a response when Ed, Edgar Schoen said that? Um, I, I, I immediately knew that was a moment that would make it in the film. But when I interview someone, you know, I mentioned earlier that I have a meditation practice. When I interview someone, I almost treat them like they are a, a thought that I'm meditating on. I am just present with them. And um, I don't try, I'm not trying to change someone in an interview as much as understand them. So whenever they bring up whatever they say, that's just something for me to be present with. And I'm present with my own feelings in the midst of that, but I do sort of treat it as um, almost like a meditation. Like I'm just there to, to see what they have. And it's interesting too, because I've had a couple of people ask me like, Oh, how could you interview that person? They're, you know, there's, you know, they have a lot of judgments about some of the characters who appear in my film. And when I sit down to interview with someone, I'm, I'm just trying to understand them. Um, I treat them the same way that I treat my own thoughts and feelings that I might have a judgment about. You know, I, there are all sorts of things within me that at times may be difficult to be with. And so when they come up, I feel like it is much better in the long term to just be present with them. And that's the same thing whenever I'm filming something, whenever you know, an interview subject, it's just, let's just see what this is. Hmm. Um, so you have said that um, creating sort of shifts in consciousness in, in the collective is one of your main focuses as, um, as a person, uh, especially in your podcast, you talk about that. And um, I really, really like that. First of all, I just want to say, like, I think that's awesome. That's definitely one of my goals as well is to transform society um, through media, through activism, through um, social entrepreneurship, through creating um, new ways of seeing reality and new ways of working with it. Um, but I want to ask, so what are kind of your other, do you have other pursuits that you're thinking about or ways that you are planning to achieve this goal of shifting consciousness? There's a lot of things I want to create and I am uncertain which of them I'll take next. So, and it's also that I am early enough in the stages of most of them that I don't know that I could talk about them coherently yet you know the film that i made it took a while for me to boil it down to a quick like two sentence summary and I'm, that actually takes a while to reach and i'm not there yet with the others so i want to create as much as possible and there are absolutely other other issues and things i feel like the way that people learn and transform is through story and so I, I go to the largest storytelling mediums we have, which right now is film. Awesome. Um, I look forward to um, continuing to be on this journey with you and see what you create. So, Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so in context of this interview, obviously, <clears throat> one of the main things we're talking about is Forage and uh, that we want to cover because creating this podcast for for forage and and so um you did not cover forage in, in your film why not again it wasn't directly relevant to the question is some circumcision something we should continue to do and i felt like getting into that you know it's something that is uh possible but it hasn't been done 
at least on a, on a, the scale that Forgen is talking about yet. So, you know, I didn't really have space for it. It wasn't directly related to the central question. And I also felt like the technology involved would have taken a considerable runtime to explain. Um, runtime was the reason a lot of things got taken out of the film. I just, there's more that I could have talked about than I had time for. So that was the reason. Right. Um, so you did cover foreskin restoration, which makes sense. I mean, that's something that's very well established already and <clears throat> that men can very easily from that point of view, you know, speak to how it affects them um, in relationship to this issue. And um, so I'm curious, is there kind of, um, do you think there's something in your film that sort of shows why forest and regeneration will be valuable? Um, do you think it's, um, yeah, is, is there? So, I mean, in the sequence of restoration, we talk about how there's already a quarter of a million men doing manual restoration, which is a five to six year process that doesn't bring everything back. So if you could bring everything back, everything back in a day, I mean, that's obviously preferable. And there's at least a quarter of a million people who would, who would pay for that right now. And maybe more because there may be a number of people who, for whom restoration is too long a process or they just don't, you know, they don't want to go that down that road. But if you told them you could just pay a bunch of money and get it today, they'd be like, of course, absolutely. So I think that the film shows that there is a large number of men who don't like that they were circumcised and would like to change that. And that there is a significant market as well that would be interested in paying for something like that. But we haven't reached the level of consciousness or awareness whereby larger biotech companies would know that that's a market. Right. And so this kind of brings up another question that somebody uh, asked, which is just what are the implications of your film for Forge? And could that um, be a force that might help bring that awareness about? I think that as people become more aware of the issue of circumcision, they're going to look for more alternatives to it, especially for the men who've already been affected by it. So... I sort of see as, as there's more awareness around this issue, there's going to be more interest in things like Forge mm -hmm. So you've been very supportive of Forge in recently. Um, uh, basically just um, thank you, first of all, you know, for, <laughs> for that support. We, we really appreciate it, um, especially coming from you, who's such a huge voice on this topic right now. Um, <clears throat> and also... Uh, I'm curious, what is it about Foragen that you like? Why, why are you supportive of us? I feel like Foragen is bringing awareness to the idea that it is possible to heal uh, this part of the body. And, you know, again, I think people have this idea that the only response you can have to the issue of circumcision is one of victimhood. And what Forgen is showing is that you could actually respond to it as an opportunity, an opportunity to bring more healing and more technology into the world. So that I think is a very positive response. And it is one that uh, I have seen online gives a lot of people hope. So instead of this idea that this happened and there's nothing you can do about it, now there's this idea that this happened and that something better might be possible. Um, I also will say, too, that, you know, as a company, um, I mean, it, it amazes me that people don't see the potential for this as a company. Like, there's this product that makes men's dicks bigger and their orgasms harder and there's a potential market for it of the majority of men in america and at least a quarter of a million people who would sign up for it right now and um like what would they pay for that i mean like you're telling me this isn't a massive 
business. And then, you know, people are like, oh, I, like people ask, ask Forgen the same question as me, like, well, how are you going to get people interested? It's like, how, how, how are you going to provide for all the people that are going to want this is the real question. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is crazy. You know, I like that figure in your film of 250,000 men because I was thinking about that and foraging would be funded if each of those men gave $1 a month. Um, we'd be funded. So it's like, how are we going to find the funding? Well, there's clearly interest. There's already the interest, you know, it's just increasing with films like this, with all the activism that's happening and the yeah. transformation around this issue. I feel like the challenge is convincing people that it's possible because I think a lot of people are, you know, would want something like this to exist, but they don't believe it's possible, which to me is also kind of absurd. You know, they have uh, had people who've had a finger cut off and regenerated that. They have fully regenerated a female vagina. Uh, there's a team in Hong Kong that did that. They have done uh, penis transplants before. They, there's, I read an article just yesterday about a place in South Korea that, clones pets for the rich and famous so like barbara streisand loved her dog her dog died she wanted a dog that was like her old dog and paid fifty thousand dollars for a place in south korea to clone her dog mm. like people you can actually the technology already exists for for human cloning for regenerating the inside of a female vagina and you're telling me it doesn't already exist for there's this, i mean the technology also exists for uh uh, fully regenerating the male genitals. So you're telling me we can't regenerate part? Like, I actually think the technology for this already exists among things that are, that are used in the world. It just hasn't been applied to this part of the body because there hasn't been the interest or awareness that someone would want that. Right. And so it's, again, just a matter of um, awareness of being in the platforms where people notice of... <clears throat> framing that we are the ones to it that we can do this that we have already done the experiments i mean yeah i'm feeling optimistic um Good. yeah so um um yeah i think i'd like to um ask you another question about your film which is how can we help support that uh, the biggest thing you can do is just tell people about it. So, you know, think about the, when you see a film, it's usually because a friend recommends it to you. And a friend's recommendation is going to do a lot more than anything they read in the news, any ad. Uh, word of mouth is the most powerful thing. So tell people about the film. Um, there's tons of stuff that we put out that you can share on social media if you want to go that route. And um, that's pretty much it. It's just word of mouth. All right, and we will link this below, but where can people find your film? Circumcisionmovie.com is the place to find it. Uh, there will be links there for all the places it's available, but you can get it on iTunes and Amazon and uh, YouTube. You know, there's a ton of different places you can get it. Uh, and you can find me online at Um and all our social media for the film is at CircMovie. It's also the hashtag for the film. And you can find me everywhere at, at BD Murata. Awesome. Um, I don't know if I'm going to remember but that circumcision movie. It's yeah. It's kind of a difficult, confusing. Yeah. It's a movie about circumcision. So you can find it on circumcision movie. Oh, I was, yeah. I know. It takes, it's a really, like, I'm, I'm a very creative person. So I wanted it to be like a, almost a riddle that I'm sure that, I had to figure out. That URL was probably taken already, so you had to find a weird name for it. Right, yeah, exactly. You know. Actually, that was one of the best things I did. It was fairly in the process. I got circumcisionmovie.com, and I was like, I don't know what the film's going to be called yet, but that's the URL. <laughs> awesome. So, Brendan, <clears throat> excuse me. Imagine that Foragen has just succeeded in making foreskin regeneration a reality for all men. How do you feel in this moment? And what are you most excited for about this moment? Uh, I am I am ready to head down to your offices and, and get it. I'm a little pissed you didn't let me invest earlier. Uh, and mostly I'm just excited. I'm just like, I'm curious what the future will bring with it. Yeah. 
is pretty exciting. Well, thank you for uh, being our guest today, Brendan. It's been a true pleasure talking with you and knowing you, and I look forward to doing with you more with you in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm.